But there was also a socio-economical problem related to the job market. The job market was getting tense because the Cold War was getting colder, so to speak. And so there was less need for so many physicists that were graduating. And so that very, I guess, there was a huge number of new PhDs during the 60s or 50s and 60s, but then uh, a tighter job market, so less jobs. And even less jobs if you were interested in the conditions of quantum mechanics because there was this strong pragmatism that was, uh, I guess, happening at the time. Super sure, there is a lot of things to discuss here, but for reasons of time, I'm going to now shift uh, towards other ways of looking at this history. So, um, this is also well known, John Clauser himself, in some notes, uh, some autobiographical like, letters or uh, articles he has on, on his own um, his, I mean, his own early, his early career, right? He, I'm not going to go over all the quotes, but I'm going to read this one um, because it relates to, to epistemological letters. So, any open inquiry into the wonders and peculiarities of quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement that went outside of a rigorous party line was then virtually prohibited by the existence of various religious stigmas and social pressures that, taken together, amounted to an evangelical crusade against such things. As a result of the evangelism, much of the early important work on the theorem was published only in an underground newspaper, this is the epistemological letters, whose circulation was limited to members of a quantum subculture and that probably cannot be found in most of physics library, libraries. Um, now, Clauser uh, has other quotes similar to this. You can see he was very unsatisfied with what, telling his own story about what happened to him when he was a graduate student at Columbia. And then he did struggle to find a permanent position. That he never found a permanent academic position, actually. Um, he has a Nobel Prize, but no permanent academic position. Uh, but, uh, so anyway, I'm not going to go over all these quotes. You can check them uh, in, in my article. Um, but let me now show you the same kind of, or a similar story from the perspective of the journalist. This has not been emphasized so far in this conference, so I think it's good to spend a bit more time looking at this. If you now try to tell this kind of the same story, or at least after the 40s, uh, of the debates from the perspective of the journals in which the articles were appearing, like what, what, which were the articles in which these figures, these uh, figures interested in the foundations of quantum mechanics, which were the, art, uh, the journals they were using to publish their more conceptual, I guess, uh, arguments? regarding quantum mechanics. Well, there is four in particular that are important. Uh, in 1940, let, let's start with the first one, 1947, that dialectical that was mentioned just before. Uh, then we have 1964, Physics, the journal Physics, where Bell published his paper. It didn't last long, I think the journal lasted like five years. Dialectica is still a prestigious journal in philosophy, so still going. Uh, then you have Foundations of Physics, founded in 1970. Um, still going, also, still prestigious, uh, uh, well known journal. And then you have Epistemological Letter, founded in 1973. So let's start with Dialectica. Dialectica was uh, created by Ferdinand Gonset, a Swiss uh, mathematician, and physicist, and philosopher. Um, he published books on mathematics, the philosophy of math, the philosophy of space and time, uh, determinism, free will, these kinds of things. Um, and then he was a professor in the ETH. He was also a professor uh, in math and philosophy of science at the University of Zurich, then at the University of Bern, and then in the ETH. Um, now, in 1948, uh, in 1944, he founded, together with Paul Bernay, Cardo, and Karl Popper, the International Society for Logic and Philosophy of Science. And in 1947, with Paul Bernay and Gaston Bachelard, he founded Dialectica. So that's how you can see someone interested in this more foundational question decided to open, together with others, like Popper, decided to open a new space for the proliferation of more or issues that were, had to do, were more interdisciplinary, if you want, uh, as opposed to just focus on the physics or the philosophy. And in the pre preface to the first issue of Dialectica, he says, 
Uh, I'm going to read this, um, the last part. For nearly each one of us, philosophical reflection will always be kept alive by the practice of scientific discipline or the ex exercise of an art. The philosopher doesn't need to renounce the specialization of a determined knowledge. It suffices that he refuses to be a purely a specialist and that he accepts dialogue and its consequences. You will see this kind of theme in the, other, in the creation of the other journals. So the point is, this is not just a fight about pragmatism. It's also, at the same time, a fight against hyper-specialization. And you will see many physicists and especially physicists interested in foundational questions, were very frustrated with the fact that there were no spaces for them to publish things that were a bit more interdisciplinary. And, well, this is, this is Dialectica. In the second year, Dialectica published perhaps the most important, or one of the most important, I think, uh, issues on the foundations of quantum mechanics. This is 1948, um, and you have papers by Bohr, Einstein, De Broglie, Heisenberg, Reichenberg, what concerned himself, and the introduction was written by Powell. Now, I think, um, we agree about that, I think this article by Howard, uh, sorry, by, by Einstein, Howard talks a lot about it, but by Einstein, uh, quantum mechanics and reality, uh, is one of the clearest expositions of Einstein's own dissatisfaction with uh, quantum mechanics as understood at the time. It is specifically clear if you want to understand the distinction between locality and separability and what exactly Einstein meant by separability, which has been also conflated in the literature. Um, anyway, this is a philosophy journal, I want to stress that. It's a philosophy journal opening space for physicists who are interested in foundational questions. Next journal, physics. Uh, physics was created by the physicists Philip Anderson and Bernd Matthews. And they said, in the first uh, issue at the beginning, the introduction, they said, in our opinion, physics has reached the point in which there is far more good physics written than any physicist can read, especially if he hopes to cover more than his own special fields. <laughs> On the other hand, it would be too bad if most physicists were to have to give up reading original material in other fields and even fairly close to their own. As perforce, most of them have long since given up reading articles in other sciences. Therefore, we believe it is a good idea to institute a selective journal in which the editors try their very best to present a selection of papers which are worth the attention of all physicists. So again, in, uh, they are saying, well, there is too many special areas now, and people are working on their own specific area. It would be good to create a space where physicists in different areas could like, uh, share kind of their work, or at least develop work that is more interdisciplinary within physics. Right? And Philip Anderson, by the way, published a good number of philosophy of science papers, too. Um, so this is another example of this kind of fight against the hyper-specialization in physics. And the next journal um, is Foundations of Physics, created in 1970 by Henry Margano and Wolfram George Rao. George Rao, um, probably I'm mispronouncing him, but he works on general relativity and he's very well known within the relativity community. I think he got the uh, uh, Einstein Medal in 1970. Um, and Margano was also, both were physicists, both were interested in the in more conceptual and foundational questions. Uh, Margano published more than 70 papers in philosophy journals, for example, even though he was uh, trained as a physicist and did a lot of important things in physics. Now, again, preface to the first issue. Very few scientific journals today encourage the speculation not tied to hard and demonstrable facts. One wonders where brilliant ideas are not lost by this restrictive attitude. Foundations of physics will publish with suitable frequency discipline speculations, suggestive, suggestive of new basic approaches in physics. Once again, a new journal is created, again, by physicists, again, in the first preface, kind of saying similar things. There is, uh, uh, there is a need to uh, be more, I guess, tolerant of crossing disciplines, at least within physics itself, uh, if not beyond and include, say, philosophy or philosophy of science. Now, this is not very well known, but in uh, 1966, actually, John Grau, together with Brett, Alan Brett, uh, 
they create, they, they organize a, a colloquium held at the University of Denver. And there, the colloquium was called Phys Physics, Logic, and History, kind of like this conference in a way. And they invited philosophers like Wine, they invited physicists, they invited, I mean, I put the list there, they invited uh, historians. And as they say, the purpose of this volume is to explore the ever present links between logic, physical reality, and history. Indeed, there are not two or three or four cultures, there is only one culture. Our generation has lost its awareness of this. Thought seriously, it is not tragic. All we need is to free ourselves from the fetters of mere technical yes and search for a comprehensive interpretation of political and physical theories. Historians, logicians, physicists uh, are all banded in one common enterprise, namely in their desire to wave and hide in the fabric of human knowledge. Again, Jarbrough was the one behind, together with Mariano, behind Foundation of Physics, was organizing things like this conference to bring together other people working in this case in history and uh, philosophy and physics all together. Okay, but this is about epistemological letters mostly. So what happened, what is the connection with epistemological letters? Well, Ferdinand Conset in 1970 turned 80. And why is that important? Well, because when he turned 80, he said, you know, I want to create an institute kind of in, in my honor, sort, sort of. Like, I want an institute that pursues the kind of philosophy that I like, which is an interdisciplinary philosophy of some sort. And so he was prominent and famous enough that they created an institute. The institute was called the Association Ferdinand Gonset, created in Vienna, in Vienna, Switzerland. And the, the goals of the institute were, again, kind of promote this kind of interdisciplinary work that would bring together physics and other disciplines in this case. It, it included education, it included economy, and it included political science too. The association created an institute, the Institute de la Method. And the institute, uh, as you say, one of the goals of the institute is, uh, is oh, some of the goals are to rank, it range from a reflection on mathematics, education to discussions of relatively technical problems, from the philosophy of physics to the promotion of a dialogue between science and philosophy. Well, this institute then created epistemological letters, which is the focus of the talk. Uh, but they published on many things. The institute created uh, mini journals, if you want to call them like that, on many topics, from education, political science, and other kinds of things. And the one that was the most successful, just by the number of years it lasted, was the one dedicated to hidden variables, and uh, what? Well, by their name, it says indeterminism, quantum indeterminism and hidden variables, right? Um, that was from 1973 to 1984. The name of the journal officially was Epistemological Letters. Now, you might wonder why, kind of in this place at this point, uh, would they gonna create something like this? Like, because this journal be eventually became very important, but you might wonder why, or what, what's the point, or um, I guess, isn't kind of weird that it's created in Vienna, which is kind of relatively small in the philosophy of physics and science. And part of the answer to this, and as in any complex phenomena, there is many causes, but a relevant cause is the fact that uh, Agnes Shimoni was in communication and was already connected to these different people working on the foundations of quantum mechanics. So you have Hans Primas in Zurich, you have Bernard Espagna in Paris, and you have Joseph Maria Job and Bell and Constantin Pilon in Geneva. And Shimoni was in collaboration with all of them. So it's and Ferdinand said too, but was that they know it knew each other. So it's not that surprising anymore because Shimoni was one of the main editors of Epistemological Letters. He wasn't officially an editor, if you actually look, the editor was Bonsac, another philosopher of science in uh, yeah. But kind of uh, uh, I guess uh, implicit editor, I don't know how to call it, someone who was helping with uh, uh, reaching out and promoting and writing things all the time in the journal was Shimon. So it's not that surprising that that happened kind of in the middle of all these networks that were around Vienna at the time with people working on the foundations of quantum mechanics. And Fla uh, this connects with Flavio, I, I, the Italian, the 1970 conference that you mentioned brought some of these figures together. So it's not surprising that two years later, 
Shimoni would be one of the, I guess, leaders in the formation of this journal. Okay, now, uh, there are at least three things I want you to, I guess, pay attention to regarding epistemological letters. The three reasons why I think epistemological letters was important as compared to other journals. One is the subject matter. You have, again, remember, you have foundations of physics, you have dialectic, um, uh, you have physics that actually died already, so physics is gone, and then you basically have the dialectic, the foundations of physics, nuovo cimento, uh, and that's it. Uh, in physics, it was very hard to call it foundational uh, question, uh, papers that were more related to the foundations of quantum. Um, now, epistemological theory was completely focused on the problem of Bell's theorem and the recent empirical test by uh, Friedman and Clauser in 1972. It actually starts with an article by Shimoni and Horn explaining what's the purpose of the journal. And they very explicitly say the purpose is to make sense of the conceptual implications of the recent test of Bell's theorem. That's the purpose, make sense of that. Basically make, make sense of the fact that quantum mechanics violate Bell's inequality. And in contrast to other journals, the foundations of physics, which between 1970 and 1976, if only 4% of all those papers made reference to Bell's result, which is surprising because eventually it would change dramatically. Compared that to epistemological letters, the whole thing was dedicated to this very specific topic, right? So I, I would like to say that data for the new Cimiento that would be an interesting thing compare how many of them were completely dedicated to the hidden variables. Because foundations of physics were dedicated to relativity, to quantum field theory, and other kinds of, of topics. Mm -hmm. Second, the distribution. This was a very particular way of uh, distributing this journal. It was sent, and I would like the help of some historians to figure out how exactly they decided, and who decided this, I haven't been able to figure out. I assumed Shimoni. Just said these are people and others, these are people working on things or people who might like to see this. I don't know. But they sent to these people the journal without, I guess, kind of a spam <laughs> because they didn't request that. Um, and you have, who you have here? Well, you have a lot of people, but very important figures, both in physics and philosophy. You have, I know, you have Deborah Bleed, you have Bohm, you have Dirac, uh, you have Feynman, uh, you have Schwinger, Wigner. You have Bell, obviously, you have then. I mean, you, we don't have time to go over all of this. Surprisingly, Italy doesn't appear here. Uh, I, this is the first list. I think the second list, I, they put these three. And they keep adding people and not always announcing them, right? And Celeri, for example, published in the journal, but he's not announcing this list. Um, but what I want to pay attention to is the fact that in the 60s, uh, late uh, or early 70s, People like Arthur Fine was in his very early stages of his academic career. And by 1974, Arthur Fine published a paper on a, 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 on a journal edited by a Suti about the foundations of quantum mechanics. He didn't cite Bell. 1974, Arthur Fine didn't cite Bell's theorem in a journal dedicated to making sense of the foundations of quantum mechanics. After that, Arthur Fine was as you all know, what's one of the main figures working on making sense of the theorems and the implications and all of that. So something really changed, or at least that's a way through, through him you can see that. The same of Van Frassen. Van Frassen doesn't cite that theorem in that same edition. He was also working on that same, in the same issue, uh, Van Frassen, um, Fine, and, and Nancy Cartwright too. But none of them cited that. So Bell was still not very well, not even by philosophers of science and physics. And I think, and this is a part of speculation, but I think it's a reasonable hypothesis, that getting this journal where every issue was on the foundations of Bell on, on Bell inequalities, like twice a year or four times a year, would in a way shape your career if you're to find and you are a physicist, mathematician, interested in philosophical questions, and you were already interested in quantum mechanics. Uh, John Ehrman also, and, and Friedman, and and any of, many other soon to become prominent figures in the philosophy of science. At that point, they were not. They were starting their careers. OK, and third and finally, uh, besides subject matter and distribution, 
The third aspect of epistemological learning that is, in, that is important, uh, in my view, is the informality of the journal. So this was a very particular journal. Uh, it was not exactly peer review, like Shimoni and others probably would kind of check and like, decide, but it was not like a normal journal or like a standard journal. For example, at the back of every journal, every volume, they would say things like this. Epistemological letters are not a scientific journal in the ordinary sense. They want to create a basis for an open and informal discussion, allowing confrontation and revenge of ideas before publishing in some adequate journal. <coughs> and it worked like a news bulletin in some ways, but let's focus on open discussions first. They really meant, when they said we want open discussions, they actually meant that. So for example, if you, you see that numerical system on the left in the table of contents. They invented that, I guess, or I mean, I don't know if they were the first ones to do that, but the, the point of that system is to keep track of who is responding to who. So for example, Costa de Buruga has 14.3, uh, that means response number 3 to original article number 14. So 14 was an original contribution, 14.3 is the third response to that contribution. And then you have 14.4, a response to, well, they actually would say sometimes in the title, response to 14.3, uh, or to something else, and so on. So they kept track of who was responding to who. In total, you have more than 70 original contributions, and more than 120 responses. So it's like an archive of some sort, it's like really promoted open discussions and you could just respond to, to three other articles that were done before you. Um, Bell's paper, The Theory of Local Devils, appeared first here uh, in this journal. Okay, and then, I mean, another other aspect of informality has to do with languages. They access the papers in German, French, and English. And finally, uh, another aspect has to do with the fact that it worked like a news quality, really. Because they would announce in the middle of the journal like things like, oh, there is a new book on the Foundation for Quantum Mechanics. Here it is, here is the reference. Or they would say, look, there is a conference on the topic of, the, I guess, the Foundation of Quantum Mechanics, this date. So they would announce these kinds of things to the community. So people would know, okay, maybe you should check that conference or try to apply or whatever. And they would say things like, Mr. Shimoni is coming to Geneva in 1978. So, I don't know, kind of open, very open about these kinds of things. So, it would work like a Facebook, Twitter, academic Twitter of the 70s for the foundations of quantum mechanics. And, also very importantly, they would transcribe talks of people working on the foundations of quantum mechanics presenting in different conferences. So they would somehow get or go there and transcribe what they're doing and then publish it in epistemological letters. So they would kind of, I guess, record the talks through the transcription and then share it with the other uh, people working on the foundations of quantum. So very peculiar journal, very, very, I guess, promoter of open discussions and keeping everybody aware of what was going on. Okay, to end, um, let me just jump to the last 35 years this is 2018, and I'm taking a class on the history of quantum mechanics and a class on the philosophy of quantum mechanics. Uh, the class was with a historian, Chris Hamlin, and the philosophy class is with Tom Howard. And the historian says, look, your final paper is going to be a paper on a very obscure uh, thing, whatever you want, an obscure article or book in the history of science in the last 150 years. And I was reading <coughs> David Kaiser's book, How the Hippies Say Physics, and I remember seeing things like, oh, this is very hard, epistemological letters are very hard to find. And so I tried to find it, and it was very hard. And like, it's, uh, some places that said they have them, they didn't have them. Pittsburgh said they have them, they don't have them, or they have like one or two. And so I really struggled, so I went to Don and I said, okay, I don't know how, how to them. proceed. And he said, actually, I have them. Yes, I have I them in the this. garage <laughs> of my house. He had them in a box because he was a student of Shimoni, and I yeah. guess Shimoni distributed this to all the other uh, people, uh, students, I guess, of the time. And so he gave me that, but he didn't have the first issue. And he wrote to the community, and Howard Stein had two copies of the first issue, so he gave us one. <coughs> and that's, we completed the collection. Uh, we digitized it, and now they are, and you can access the demo.
And just to end, I want to end with this phrase of the conference I mentioned before on the logic and history and philosophy. Now that we have come to the end, we ask ourselves whether we have indeed built bridges among the disciplines of logic, physical reality, and history. As far as we are concerned, our horizons have expanded and we shall return to our diverse academic duties with renewed enthusiasm for philosophical and scientific inquiry, as well as for the difficulty task of communicating our newest and best interests to others. Our historic sites have been raised too. Oh, thank you very much, Sebastian. That was a wonderful paper. I've really enjoyed your chapter too. And you open up a lot of really interesting questions about outlets and how foundations, uh, about which we've already heard some. You actually touched on a point I think none of, none of us as historians have really looked into, and that's the ro rise of the philosophy of physics as its own specialisation within philosophy which seems to, it's always existed in some sense, but seems to get really going in the 70s. You mentioned Arthur Fine, but David Malamon and, and various others come to mind. Um, do you think you could follow up? Did they contribute to epistemological letters, the philosophers uh, who were becoming philosophers of physics? Uh, so I know, I think Fine has a, a contribution there. I have to look for the other ones. Uh, I, I have to, I'm not sure. I, I remember it was hard to find their contribution, but I did ask some of them, and they said they were reading. They were reading it. But I, I don't know how much they were writing. And okay. Yeah, I have to check. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Only about a quick one. And that's, that's done. Quick, but it's too quick. <laughs> this wonderful talk could also be a talk about this person, Admin Shimon. Uh, we cannot understand what happened in the debates about the foundation of physics without considering him uh, and his role and his connection with philosophy and physics. And the second, uh, the 1974 conference in Strasbourg, you cited here, uh, was promoted by two people. One uh, was with us yesterday, Michel Paty, who is still alive. And the second, uh, the Brazilian physicist, José Lito Lopes, who uh, has passed away a few years ago. Okay.